Okay, it looks like everybody has voted just as the timer reached zero. So yeah, we're looking at this sequence of polynomials and it's not just any sequence, it's a very suggestive sequence. Uh, one, one plus x, one plus x plus one over two factorial x squared. Every time we add over a one over n factorial x to the n, and this should remind you something, uh, there's some special function that looks a little bit like this. Let's see what you guys said about this thing. Okay, so we have one person, the limit does not exist. Three people said the limit exists and is a polynomial, and the limit exists but is not a polynomial, is the most popular with five, so about half the people think the limit exists and is not a polynomial. About half the people think something else happens. Pretty split. Uh, I guess, okay, there, maybe there's one piece of background knowledge that if you do not know the background knowledge will be, make it quite a hard problem. Uh, there is a famous function that has this one over n factorial x to the n thing going on. Does anyone know what the famous function is that has a one over n factorial x to the n? Yeah. Exponential. Yeah, the exponential function. So I guess the, the fact you need to know to do this problem is that the function e to the x is equal to the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial, where 0 factorial is 1 would give the first term. Uh, and that's a fact you've probably seen before. When people write this, they usually mean in like classes before, this kind of class about functional analysis, they mean Pointwise, so they mean for every x, for every x. And saying it's true for every x, this infinite sum is really a limit. And what they're saying is that the limit as n goes to infinity of the polynomial Pn of x equals e to the x pointwise. So they pointwise, the pointwise limit. So for every possible x, where Pn are those polynomials that we had before. So the first n term. I guess I should use a different letter. k going from 0 to n of x to the k over k factorial. Okay. So it's definitely true pointwise. And the only thing that is maybe new that you haven't seen before, and is the point of the course right now, is to talk about it in norms. So talk about it in the uniform norm. And so about half the people thought that the limit exists, and we're talking about the limit with respect to this norm. So those people presumably think that the uh, it converges not only pointwise, but it converges in norm. Uh, the people who said it exists and is a polynomial, maybe there's something that changes with this norm, right? Like maybe uh, something happens. Uh, so now we know what the limit could possibly be. It could, it could potentially be this e to the x function. And that's definitely true pointwise. Does it converge in norm? Does the limit work in norm too? in the infinite norm. Okay, and this is exactly the kind of theme we started last class with too. We had some sequence of functions that were converging pointwise, but not in L infinity. Here is some sequence of functions that's converging pointwise, and I'm asking you, does it work in L infinity? Okay, and because we're pretty, pretty split, and because some people walked in a little late, let's revote. So talk to your neighbors, think about how you would go about proving that, and what would you check? How do you check things? Uh, it is relevant that we're on the interval 0 to 1. That's, so we're on some fixed interval 0 to 1. Uh, you would get a different answer depending on what... If you, if you change 0 to 1 to something else, you might get a different answer. So it's important that it's 0 to 1. Okay, let me open it up again and give you a few more minutes to think about what happens. And let's, let's uh, do it. Limit of polynomials v2. Okay.
Okay, uh, so I only gave you two minutes. Is that enough time? Does anybody want one more? Anybody for more time? Okay, let's let's just see then. There's what you guys said. Maybe maybe everybody switched. I will say this morning in my other class, uh, there was like a slight majority and a slight slightly below fifty percent, and then we revoted and people moved onto the majority category. So it went from being like fifty five forty five to like seventy thirty. And then the 70% was wrong. So people switched the majority and they were wrong. So let's see what happens today in this class. All right, so everybody jumped on to the majority here that the limit exists but is not a polynomial. And that's correct, that's correct. So, so, so you did the right thing here. So this limit not only does it work point-wise, but it also works in the norm infinity. Let me show you how in case uh, you didn't maybe see how. This, this could work. So not only is the limit, the point-wise limit, uh, n goes to infinity of p n to the x, in infinity as well. Uh, I guess, yes, yes, it does. <laughs> okay. um, and the way you do it, let's, first of all, let's give this function a name, because it doesn't have a name right now. Let's call it uh, f of x, um, because we're really talking about the norm of p n minus f infinity, right? And what we're trying to show is that this limit is zero. This is what it means for the limit to exist, that pn minus f is zero. And fortunately, pn minus f is itself a sum. f is, we know for every point it's this infinite sum. pn is the first few terms of the sum. And so if you take f minus pn, I should do f minus pn. Of course, you could do it the other way. It's exactly the same, but let's do f minus pn uh, because that has a nice formula, which is it's the limit as n goes to infinity. It's just the, what I call the tail of the sum. So you start at n plus 1, and you go to infinity, and we're doing x to the n over n factorial, uh, x to the k, rather. So it's the norm of this guy. So that's what we're trying to show. And um, this is, we can just keep working with this. This is the kind of manipulation you do. You're doing the norm of some big sum, but by triangle inequality, the norm of some big sum. So let's, let's get rid of the limit here and just do it like this. And we'll work on it, and we'll show that the limit is zero. Uh, it's going to be less than n plus one to infinity, and then the norm Are of this. Yes, very good. I got excited, and I wrote too many exclamation points everywhere. Okay, very good. <laughs> X to the k. Yeah. Okay. And what is the norm infinity of x to the k over k factorial? We finally got to a point where we're going to be concrete and actually use the actual functions that were given to us. Did anyone? Does anyone know the norm of this one? Yeah. It would be one over k factorial. It's one over k factorial. So you could even do one more step if you want before you could avoid being concrete for one more step, and pull out the factor of uh, of k factorial, and then the norm of x to the power k is one because it's really where does the function x to the k achieve its largest value? And because we're on the interval 0 to 1, the function x to the k, it starts at 0 and it ends at 1. And kind of like how quickly it gets there depends on k, but the norm is always 1. Uh, so this will be equal to k equals n plus 1 to infinity of 1 over k factorial times 1. Okay, and this is, this is where it was important that because uh, we are on the interval 0, 1. So if you're on any interval that is bounded, like negative 100 to 100, instead of you would have a 100 to the power k there, and the rest of the argument wouldn't change. But if you're on an unbounded interval, like all of R, 
everything I'm about to say would not apply because the norm infinity of the function x to the k would be infinity. Uh, but because we're on this interval 0, 1, the answer here is just 1. It's all very nice. Uh, OK, so we've gotten to this point. We've taken the norm. And the norm is this tail of the sum 1 over k factorial. And I claim that this is going to 0. Claim this is going to 0 as n goes to infinity. And because this goes to 0 as n goes to infinity, the whole thing goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. And that is what we're trying to show. We're trying to show that this difference goes to 0. Why does this go to 0 as n goes to infinity? Yeah? Well, as n goes to infinity, if you look back at the original, at the BA, as n goes to infinity, yeah. at 1, you're going to get the sum of all the reciprocal of the factorials. And yes. because f has to be e to the x, the sum of the reciprocal of the factorials has to be e. So that sum is, is, is basically e minus of value that's basically 0. So yeah, that's right. That's right. That's very good. So, so we have the sum of 1 over k factorial. And so you could bust out to prove that this converges. So this is the tail. This converges to 0. That happens if and only if the infinite sum, the infinite sum, the sum going from k equals 0 to infinity of 1 over k factorial is, exists. Right? So if you want to know if the tail of some sum is going to 0, well, you just look at the whole sum. If that sum is some finite number, then the tails have to go to 0. That's exactly what it means for the sum, the infinite sum to exist. And so you could bust out all the tools you learned in calculus about, like, ratio tests and all that stuff and figure it out. But actually, the sum of 1 over k factorial, it was, that's equal to e. So if you plug in, if you plug in x equals 1, we said that this exists for, for every x. But when you plug in x equals 1, oh no, it's not letting me write. Let's see what the problem is. Can I click? I can't, I can't even click on things. What a disaster. Can I click on things here? Can I click on things like this? Okay, so something's wrong with the, the Blackboard function. Okay, oh, it will let me change the, the pen, but not, not right. Okay, let me try closing this. Uh, I'll say what I'm about to say verbally, and then I will try to reopen it. But it works for every x, in particular when x equals one, you get that infinite sum is e. So this infinite sum uh, down here, I, can't, I also cannot scroll. OK, I'm starting to see the magnitude of the problem. Uh, the infinite sum that we wanted is finite. OK, let me reopen this. Did we just get, we got a, a line over here? OK, let's close this and try again. Close, uh, quit. OK, we're back. OK, so it works for every x, and in particular when x equals 1, we know, uh, let's do this. When x equals 1, we know e is the sum uh, starting at 0 going to infinity of 1 over k factorial. And so this whole sum, it definitely goes to 0 because this thing exists. It's, def it's just e. OK. So we took the norm of the individual terms. We used triangle inequality. And if the sum of the norms converge, uh, for this infinite sum, then the whole thing is going to converge. Uh, very nice general fact and being used for polynomials here. Uh, OK. Questions or comments about that proof? So again, we're studying in this course spaces of functions, and we're looking at limits and things. And today we're going to work on open and closed sets. And I'm bringing up this example to ask a question about the set of polynomials, which is a set, right? So every individual polynomial is like a point. If you look at the collection of all polynomials, that is some subset of the space of functions. So the set of all polynomials, in the textbook they call this script P. So they call this P01. This is polynomials on 0, 1. That is some set. And this is a subset of all the continuous functions, which they call C, 0, 1, right? And we've just taken a limit of P, and we got something that's not a polynomial. So the function e to the x is not a polynomial, but you can take the limit of polynomials and get something that is not a polynomial. So we have shown, we have shown uh, there exists P, 
Pn converging to some function f with Pn in script P. That's an L, that's not a P. P. But f is not in P. Okay, and this is, I guess this is the reverse of the definition of a closed set. A closed set is a set that contains all its limits. And so we've shown that the space of polynomials is not closed. So therefore, P01 is not closed. Okay. Ah, okay, look, and we're getting to a note from a different class, which is very nice. Okay, so, so P is not closed. Uh, so a very reasonable question to ask is if you took the space of polynomials and you include all these limit points, all the points that you can get to as a limit of polynomials, that set is called the closure of P. Let me put this one as a definition. And I did think I decided, based on the poll that you guys did, that the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to use this uh, typed math as sort of the overworld. This is like the, this is going to put all our quests in here, and then we're going to go do the quests in the, in the blackboard. Or if you like Mario, this is like when you choose your level, and then go do the level. That'll be like the blackboard. So I'm going to put like important definitions and statements and stuff here. Um, and so one thing that we're going to do is the definition of a closed set, which you should have seen before. Uh, closed set, is that even in the book? I'm not sure it's in the book. Uh, yeah, let's, let's do open set because I want, here I have S is closed means I have this written down. What's the definition of a closed set? Some people think it's not an open set. Well, you're close. It's the complement is open. S complement is open. Okay, but what, is, what does open mean? An open set, S, is open. What does it mean if it's open? It means that every point has a little ball surrounding it. So for all X in S exists epsilon so that the ball centered at x of radius epsilon is entirely in S. OK. Uh, all right. Those are open and closed sets. And of course, the ball of radius x and, and the ball centered at x and then radius epsilon, you've probably seen before in a metric space where you have a distance function. So the ball is all the things that are within distance epsilon of x. But for us, our distance function is made by the norm. So for, for us, we have the definition of a ball, ball of x epsilon. It's the set of uh, points that are within x minus y norm of epsilon. So all the things are like that. OK, so we have open and close. And the thing we're actually using, because this complement thing is not that useful, we're going to use this fact that s is closed if it contains all its points. All its limit points. So if if uh, x n goes to x, oh, it occurs to me. This is a theorem in the book. Yeah, yeah. Here we go. Let me write it down as a theorem. So theorem 1.3.21. S is closed if and only if. Uh, so for all sequences x n in S with the limit n goes to infinity of xn equals x. So you have some convergent sequence made of points in s, then x is also in s. So it contains its limit point. It contains its limit point. OK, so we just showed the space of polynomials is not closed. Uh, proving this if and only if the complement is open, like proving theorem 1.3.21 is a kind of a classic metric spaces type proof about open and closed sets that you've hopefully seen before. Um, it's not too hard. It's a good one to think about to make sure things are making sense. Who's seen that kind of proof before? Or is confident that they could reconstruct it? OK, I'll leave it as an exercise then. Uh, so yeah, basically, if you can draw a little epsilon ball around points in S complement, then of course the limit cannot get to a point in S complement. It's, it, this little epsilon of the open set of S complement is like a moat that the limit cannot possibly cross. And that is why the limit cannot escape the set S when S is a closed set. Um, but I'll let you think of the details, or, or come ask me, and I can show you. Um, 
but we're going to take that as uh, an okay thing. And then we're going to ask, what is the closure of the space of polynomials? So the space of polynomials is not itself closed. What, it, what does the closure mean? The closure means take the set, add in all the limit points. That will be a closed set. And uh, what is that set? And so this is also a theorem in the book. Theorem 1.3 point. Okay, I, I have both of these listed as 1.3 point 21. So of course there's a, an error <laughs> probably in this one. Uh, so check the number on this if you're following along in the textbook. Uh, but the closure, the closure of S is the set which is all the points that are limits of things from S. So X such that there exists a sequence, a sequence Xn uh, all in S with the limit as n goes to infinity of Xn equals S equals X. So anything that you can get as a limit of things in S, that set, it turns out, is a closed set. Uh, you might wonder, why is that even a closed set? That's actually something that requires proof. You see, you have the space S, and you throw in all the limit points. But maybe there are like limit points of the limit points that are not included here, right? So a space is closed if it contains all its limit points. This contains all the limit points of S, but does it contain all the limit points of itself? You see? So you have to do a little bit of work to check that it really is uh, even a closed set. That's like an annoying little argument. Uh, but it is true. And the theorem proves that this is the same as the following. It's the intersection of all the closed sets that contain S. So S is a super, C is a superset, superset, is that a thing? Of S of C. So if you intersect all the closed sets that contain S, you get this thing called the closure. That's the definition the textbook uses of the closure. And then they prove that it's equal to this thing of tossing in all the limit points as a, a, a theorem. In any case, that's the closure. I'll give you a, a quick example with a picture. Uh, I'm not going to do the proof of this one because two reasons. One is the textbook says it's an exercise. So I came up with some like crappy little thing here, but uh, it's, not, it's a little half-baked. And um, it's kind of annoying. I don't think it's very instructive. But let me give you a picture. So I think that'll be more instructive. So, I, and I'm gonna make a new note because we're gonna running out of space here. So, so the closure. So the closure of some set S. Um, it's two things. It's the add in the limit points. The limit points of S. And this is why we love the blackboard math because we can just be. We can, be, we can just be kind of informal. You saw the formal definition a minute ago. And it's also the intersection of all the closed sets that contain S. Uh, and I'll give you an example here. If you have some open set like this, so this is some open ball, some open set. Let's call this a O. And you can ask, what is the closure of O? So one way you can do it is you can add in all the limit points. So you add in any point you can sort of like get to as a sequence of points. You add in, and that'll include the boundary, right? Any point on the boundary of O, you can sort of get to by taking a sequence of points inside. So that's this idea of adding the limit points. Or you could say, you know, there's this closed set that looks like this, uh, and that is a closed set. Everything inside here, that's a closed set, and it contains S. And if you, I guess I'm calling it O, it contains O. And if you shrink that, you do the intersection of all the possible ways you could do that, you would get exactly to the boundary as well. And so the theorem says that these two things are exactly the same. Um, we're constructing a set in sort of from the outside in, this is from the outside in, and this is from the inside out. And they're both the same. That's the closure. Uh, okay. I'm about to set you loose to try to guess what is the closure of the space of polynomials. We proved it's not closed because there was at least that one sequence that got to the e to the x function. But what happens when you include all the points? What do you get? Yeah. It would be the set of analytic functions. Uh, it might be. This is one possible thing. And so I have this question. And I have a little text box. And you can write in whatever you think. So, uh, And the answer will be something like a sentence, like a set of analytic functions, or something like that. Uh, OK. And again, it's important that we're on 0, 1, and not on like all of R. Things change a little bit when you're on all of R. On 0, 1, 
Uh, you saw before that the polynomials are bounded, right? Like a, the polynomial x to the n is a bounded function on 0, 1. It's an unbounded function on r, and that makes a difference. Okay, and again, this is one, I should do a better job of labeling these. But this is one where the proof is quite tricky. So being able to prove what the closure of p is, is quite hard. But just being able to think of what it is, or maybe you've seen the proof before, uh, is something that you can think of and might know how to do. So you can get the answer. Uh, the proof is, is tricky. Uh, okay, let me set you loose and give you a few minutes. Feel free to chat with people about what you think it is. So there's only like 30 seconds left. Only four people have answered, uh, but I'm going to encourage everybody else to just take a guess. Your, your guess might be, I have no, no idea at all. Uh, try to think of something it could be. Again, this is one where to really prove it rigorously uh, would be harder than just taking a guess at what it is. And the main thing I want to do is just have you think about it for a second before I tell you uh, what it's going to be. All right, so put in, put in your guesses, even if uh, you're not sure, that way you get the the little mark that you were here on the day. Okay, let me press the stop button. Okay, a couple people answered. Let me wait for one more second, and then I will reveal what do people say. All right, uh, so analytic functions, real analytic functions, a few people have said that, which is very nice. Uh, X and trig are also basically analytic functions. So these are special analytic functions. Uh, analytic functions just means equal to its Taylor series expansion. So you have this infinite sequence for it, this infinite sequence, like we saw for the exponential. The exponential is a particularly pretty example. I guess I would have to go back to the other note. Uh, so, and so expand trigger like the analytic functions whose sequence you can write down from memory. And then analytic functions are like, you put in any coefficients you want, that's what you get. Uh, so the set of analytic functions, one person said continuous functions. So some functions are continuous, but not analytic. In particular, analytic means they're sort of equal to their Taylor series expansion. So analytic, analytic 
means equal to series um, expansion. And unfortunately, on R, there are some functions that are continuous but not analytic. So for example, you can have a function whose derivative is zero and all infinitely many of its derivatives are zero in some interval, but then all of a sudden it shoots off and is not zero. So you can have a function that looks like this. Um, so let me draw the axes. So it's zero and one are over here. And there's some function that is very flat. So around a half, it's like perfectly flat. And by flat, I mean, not only is f of x, f of, um, let's say f of a half equal to zero, and not only is the derivative equal to zero, that's normally when people think flat, they think it's locally zero, like that a quadratic function would be flat at zero. But this function has the property that all of its derivatives are equal to zero. So it's sort of infinitely flat here, and then maybe it does something weird like that. So there are functions that are like this. In fact, I can tell you a formula for one, e to the minus one over x, uh, I guess minus a half squared, we'll, we'll do that. Um, so there's functions that are flat and are continuous, but are not analytic. So you guys were guessing, okay, what's well, the, the functions that are analytic that you can write down as a series expansion. This function cannot be written down as a series expansion because the series expansion would be zero, 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 zero um, based on this point, but the function is not always zero. And it turns out the correct answer is that you can get any continuous function. So uh, I said all continuous functions, this answer is perfectly correct. Um, even though the computer is marking it as wrong because you didn't spell it exactly the same way I did, you can get all continuous functions. So this function, even though it is not analytic, you can approximate it by polynomials. It's just that those polynomials won't be related to the derivatives of the function. So you'll find some other polynomials. You'll find some weirdo polynomial that goes like this. It goes up and down. Maybe there's like a degree 1,000 polynomial with 1,000 bumps up and down, and it can approximate this flat part of the function even though it's not the zero polynomial. So you can approximate any function by polynomials on the interval zero. Yeah, was there a question over here? No. no. Okay, so this theorem, this is called the stone wire stress theorem. The stone wire stress theorem. It's theorem, uh, and it says that any continuous function can be approximated by polynomials in the L infinity norm. Any continuous function can be uniformly, so uniformly means in the uniform norm, approximated by polynomials. Okay. So if you've never heard of this theorem, then I guess you are unlikely to get the question right. Who's heard of the stone wire stress theorem before? In the textbook, they just call it the wire stress theorem, and they leave Mr. Stone away. I don't know why. I don't know the history. Okay, so it's a good, a good theorem. And it actually has a really nice proof. There's a nice proof with probability, which I like. Maybe I'll post that one day. Okay. Um, but let me add this to the little overworld here, because in the book, they give this a name. They call this uh, example. What do they call it? Example 1.3.24. Example 1.3.24 is that uh, the closure, the closure of the polynomials, say C, of the polynomials is all continuous functions, and this is zero. Okay. Um, when you have a set like the set of polynomials whose closure is the entire space, they give mathematicians give that a cool name. When the closure is everything. That has a name, and it's called dense, i.e. the polynomials are dense in the continuous functions. So the statement of the stone wire stress theorem, you can also say like this, the polynomials are dense in the continuous functions. Dense means literally the closure of the set equals the other set. Uh, another example you might know is that the rational numbers are dense in the real numbers. That is saying that every real number can be approximated as a limit of rational numbers. Here we're saying every continuous function can be approximated as a limit of polynomials. Again, you have to be on a on zero one or some bounded set. It doesn't work on all of R, but it does work on zero one. Uh, okay. Great. Questions about that one? 
Uh, so this is a really good example that I made sure to spend lots of time on because on your homework, I think one of the hardest problems is calculating the closure of several sequence spaces. So there's C, C0, and C00, and I ask you to calculate the closure of all of these. Um, now you know what closure is. You know the kind of thing you have to do. The problem you have is definitely doable, and that's the kind you can write out the full proof. Uh, it is much easier than this set of polynomials because the sequences sort of like go in order. So it's easier than, than this one, um, which was a little trickier. Uh, but on the other hand, I think the homework is technically due on Friday, and today is only Tuesday, and I'm only telling you about closure now, which doesn't seem very fair. So would you guys like an extension to have a few extra days to work on the closure? Yes, please. Okay, so let me give you a one-week extension on the homework so that you have at least one week of knowing what closure means. So you can try that problem. And uh, again, you have to think of how you can, what, what kinds of limits can you make, right? So just like we had the set of polynomials, what kinds of functions can you make with polynomials? Uh, I showed you the e to the x example, and you know, there's trickier ways to make non-analytic functions. You have to do that on sequences. So is that like a week from today, or a week No, a week, today? take the due date, add one week to it. Yes. Okay. Take the due date and add one week, which I guess makes it due next Friday, if that, okay. Yeah. That's a very good question. Okay. Uh, yeah. Is it possible for a sequence to converge to multiple? Oh, that is a great, that is a fantastic question, right? Like you would think there's nothing stopping you from doing that. Um, it turns out that in norm spaces or in metric spaces, the limit is unique. And the way you show that is if you have xn is converging to x and xn is converging to y, you will show that the distance between x and y has to be zero. Why is the distance between x and y zero? Well, it can be made less than epsilon to any of these things. So you make the distance on, from x less than epsilon over 2. You make this one less than epsilon over 2. And then the distance between x and y is less than epsilon. Um, and you show their distance is zero. That is actually one of the exercises, I think, in the very uh, beginning of the, the textbook. So that's a good one to do as well, although a little pedantic. Uh, yeah, great, great question. Uh, any other questions? OK, so let's do another example like this on this like closure thing. And we're going to add in one new idea, which is compact. Compact. Um, so I'm going to add in another definition of a compact set. And uh, some people say compact is something to do with open covers and subcovers. But the definition the textbook uses is that compact means uh, k is compact means, what does it mean? Uh, every sequence has a convergent subsequence. So if xn is some sequence in k, in k is some sequence, then there exists a convergent subsequence x and k, which converges to something uh, x. OK. OK. So have you guys seen this uh, kind of thing with the sequences and convergent subsequences before? People are not. OK. So that's the definition of compact. And it turns out this is not in the book. I don't know why they don't put it in the book. But it's the same thing as this open cover, open cover finite subcover thing. Uh, all right. I guess there's one I, ne I never said that is useful is the notion of bounded. I'm going to also say let's, let's put the definition of bounded on the board as well. The definition of bounded. Uh, set, let's call it B, is bounded if and only if there exists some M in R so that the norm of X is less than M for all X in B. So there's some thing that contains everybody. That is what bounded means. Uh, okay. Yeah. For the uh, compact definition, is it technically like for all xn sequences? Uh, yes. I, so yeah, I, I wrote it the way I wrote it. I was like, if xn is some sequence, is what I meant. Um, so if you have some sequence, but if you want to write for all, maybe that's even more clear. For all, let's say, sequences xn, there exists a convergence of sequence. OK. Um, so that's. Compact, and again, I have an example for you. Also, will be good practice for the type of thing you see on the homework because it, this one is sequences. So I have the space C of sequences which are bounded 
by some number. So they're the norm, which is the this is the the one norm, the soup. Sorry, it's the infinity norm, the soup of all of the entries. That definitely is a finite number for all the points in C. And now I make the set B bar, which is the set of things whose norm is less than or equal to one. Their norm is less than or equal to one. Uh, so question, is it a bounded set? Is it a closed set? Is it a compact set? And you have yes or no for each one. And I'll let you think a little bit about these. Some of them are quite easy, uh, and then they get a little more complicated. Um, but this is the kind of thing you can think of an example for. OK, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you like two minutes to think. Or potentially longer. Let's do three minutes. Okay, I'm getting the feeling you guys need more time. Who needs more time? All right, let me give you a solid, a solid chunk here. I think this is a good one to, to get your hands dirty with, and especially because the sequences appear on your homework, this is a good example to, to try to work through and take your time and, uh, and think a little bit about what these things mean and like what, ki what kinds of things are these sequences with this uh, norm.
Hmm? Okay, let me let me start the timer up again. I guess oh. it's been a couple of minutes. It, it was paused. We're after a few people who have answered, so let me let me do two more. Minutes. Okay, so there's like five seconds left. I was thinking about this closed set one, and I had a nice argument that works for this specific example, and then I was thinking about how you can make it more general. And I think I discovered how to do it in the last two seconds. Uh, but let's see, okay, we have nine people in here, and there's nine people who answered 10, okay, I guess there's 10 people. Uh, let's see what you guys said. And I'm gonna start with bounded. Yes, it's bounded, 10 out of 10, very good. It is bounded. Uh, Maybe I shouldn't have given the definition, but it's bounded by one. So as, as long as there's some amount that um, bounds it, then it's nice. Uh, bounded is an, a useful property to, to know. I think there is one thing on the homework. Uh, it's that one with xn is going to x. Does, does the averages of the xn also go to x? Uh, that one, when I went to work on it, I used boundedness at some point in my proof. Um, so boundedness is a nice property to keep in mind. Because when things are bounded, you have some number and you, know, you just like know the worst case scenario of your points. And when you know the worst case scenario of your points, you can sort of like start to do some things that um, you might want to do. So bounded is a good property. You guys all know this one is bounded almost by definition. What about closed? What do people say for closed? For closed, people said, nine people said, yes, it's closed. One person said, no, it's not closed. The correct answer is, and let me do this first. The correct answer is... Yes, it's closed. It's closed. So very good. Um, this one is a little bit uh, tricky, or can be. Um, but if you work through it, uh, there is a nice thing. So this one is closed. What you have to show to show that b bar 0, 1 is bounded, uh, not bounded. I want to show it's closed. Bounded was easy. To show that it's closed, what you're showing is if you have some sequence xn going to x, and the norm of the xn's are less than or equal to 1, then the norm of x is less than or equal to 1, 2, right? So if you have some sequence of points whose norm is less than 1, then they're included in b bar. And then we want the limit x to also be in b bar, right? This is what we have to show, must show. And it turns out, so you could make some specific argument about in this specific case, we have sequences, and you could look at if the norm of xn is less than one, then every single entry of xn is less than one, right? And if every single entry of xn is less than one, then the limit of those things will also be less than one. So you can look specifically in this case, but actually there is a nice theorem which says that if xn is converging to x, then the norm of the xn converges to the norm of x. 
So right, the first kind of convergence is convergence in the normal vector space, and the second kind of convergence is convergence of numbers. Right, and the proof. So this is a, I guess this is like a lemma, a nice lemma, and the proof. Use the fact that the difference, um, I believe this is the inequality that I want, the xn minus x in absolute value is less than or equal to the norm of xn minus x. Some people call this the reverse triangle inequality, um, but I believe this is also in the textbook. So if you manipulate triangle inequality in the right way, uh, you will get this thing, and this is by the triangle inequality, by the triangle inequality for norms. Okay, I'll leave that as an exercise. But if you believe that, then if xn minus x goes to zero, that's the right-hand side going to zero. Then, of course, the left-hand side, which is the difference in the norms, also goes to zero. That's exactly this thing. So whenever you have convergence, the norms also converge. So if you have a bunch of things whose norm is less than one, then, of course, the limit will also be less than or equal to one. Uh, it's important that it's less than or equal to, right? If it was less than, it would not be true. You could have a bunch of things whose norm is less than one, and the limit would be something whose norm is exactly equal to one. That could happen. Um, but with less than or equal to, uh, we are happy. So that's good. Okay, so uh, I'll leave it at that, because most people got it. The last one is the exciting one. So closed and bounded. And let me hide the results. Let's see what you said for the last one. Is it a compact set? 10 out of 10 people said, yes, it is a compact set. And the answer is, no, it's not a compact set. No, it's not a compact set. So this is the whole point that we wanted to get to. And this is the exciting thing. So if 100% of people are getting it wrong, that means probably that means I made a mistake. <laughs> no, uh, it really is not a compact set. And so this is the exciting thing about this course is you have learned in the past that compact just means closed and bounded. And that is only true in finite dimensional spaces. In fact, the next theorem we're going to prove is that uh, this is theorem 1.3.34, 1.3.34, which is that the, the closed unit ball, the closed <coughs> unit ball, that's exactly the set I had on the board. So the set of things that are within some norm less than or equal to things. So let's write it down. Uh, a bar B. Let's say zero R, uh, which is the set of X such that the norm of X is less than or equal to R. This is compact if and only if the space is finite dimensional. So like the weirdness we had before of there only being one norm on any finite dimensional space. On any finite dimensional space, we saw that one norm is basically you take the norm of all the individual components, you write it as a vector, you take the norm of all the individual components, you add them up. Um, there's only one norm on finite spaces, and only the finite spaces, finite dimensional spaces, are the ones where the unit ball is compact. All the other ones, it's not compact. And when it's not compact, you have all sorts of slippery ways. It kind of means that there's sort of infinitely many directions your subsequence can escape into, and you can't nail it down. Um, I, I did not anticipate that nobody would know that it's compact. Because my, my question was going to be, can you think of a sequence who has no convergent subsequence? There are lots of sequences like that. So let's, let's, uh, let me phrase that problem to you now. So is there, is there a sequence in B bar 0, 1? Again, on the, let's work on, on C, which is the sequences who are bounded um, bounded sequences, uh, who's, who has no convergent subsequences, who has no convergent subsequences. I mean, the answer is yes. I told you the answer is there are some, some but can we think of an example? And there's actually some simple examples. So you, you want, again, it's going to be a sequence of sequences. The rules are the norm of the sequence always has to be less than or equal to 1, but there's no way to make it converge, not even by taking a subsequence. Slippy run. Okay, let me tell you on example. This is the example I have in mind. Uh, 
Here's my sequence. Xn is the sequence which starts with a bunch of zeros. So it's 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And then it has a 1 in the nth position. And then after that, it's 0, 0, 0 forever. 0 forever. So that's Xn. This is a little bit like the uh, sequence version of that sliding spike function we saw before in Desmos, right? So that was a function on 0, 1, and it had a, spike, had a 1 spike where it was equal to 1, and that spike is kind of collapsing in towards 0, and it gets infinitely close to 0. This function is kind of, it's a, first of all, it's a sequence, but it's kind of the opposite. It's zeros everywhere. It has a spike here in the nth position, and that spike goes out further and further towards infinity. So in the spike example in Desmos, the spike was getting smooshed towards 0. In this one, the spike is like moving out to infinity and like leaves towards infinity. But hopefully the sequence is pretty clear. It's a 1 in the nth position. And this thing cannot possibly have any convergent subsequence. Uh, why can it have no convergent subsequence? Well, the pointwise limit of xn is the sequence of all zeros. So xn in any individual coordinate is converging to 0. Why is it converging to 0? Well, actually, any individual coordinate is 1 exactly once, and then it's 0 after that forever. Right? So any individual coordinate, like the 1,000th coordinate, will be one exactly once, and then after that it'll be all zeros. So if xn had a limit, that limit would have to be the sequence of all zeros. But it's definitely, xn is not converging to the, the all zeros function, because this thing is always norm one, and the all zeros function is norm zero. They can't possibly have convergence. And in fact, any subsequence of xn has the same property. So any, any subsequence, subsequence xnk has every individual individual component converging to zero. Um, but cannot converge to the zero vector. Let's see, this is a good use of zero vector. Since the norm x n k minus the zero vector is always one, the norm is one, because you have this spike that's always height one somewhere. So if you do act the norm of x and k, it's always one. So it's a sequence one, 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 one. It's not converging to the zero function. It can't converge to anything. Uh, this is quintessentially, this is my, how you should think about a compact set. A compact set is somewhere where you have these sequences that sort of like escape off to infinity in some sense, right? In this situation, you're escaping off to infinity, not because the entries themselves are getting big, but because you kind of like, you have one entry of size one and where it is is kind of escaping. That's why it's not a compact set. In, let me give an example in R2. In R2, I'm picking R2 because that's the, the one I can draw on the board. In R2, what does a non-compact set looks like? It's a set where there's a path to get to infinity, right? So in R2, uh, a non-compact set is a non-bounded set. Right? There's like some sequence where you can like escape to infinity, and then you have a sequence. When you escape to infinity, no subsequence of that sequence will converge. So I don't know, maybe it's like some set like this, like some, some channel like this. And you can take a sequence of points that is leaving and goes off to infinity. When it goes off to infinity, there's no way for it to have a convergent subsequence. So that's what non-compact looks like in R2, but non-compact in an infinite dimensional space you can sort of escape off to infinity in a different weird direction of this, like using the fact that you have infinitely many entries here. Um, okay, so there's a sequence with no converging subsequence, and that is showing you that the ball in this space is non-compact. And the next thing I'm gonna do is give you a sketch of this proof that the unit ball is compact if and only if the space is finite dimensional. Uh, I might have to skip a lemma for time, but I'll give you a sketch of the proof. Uh, but before we do that, maybe more important than the uh, proof, any questions or comments about this uh, stuff? So yeah, in, uh, the way I think about it is in finite dimensional spaces, the only way you can escape is either you're not a closed set or you're not a bounded set, but in the infinite dimensional space, you can escape into the infinity of the dimensions like you saw in this example. Um, and that's kind of what makes these spaces nasty and hard to work with. Okay, let's uh, do the proof. So I'm going to prove um, this thing. 
the closed unit ball is compact if and only if the space is finite dimensional. And one direction is pretty easy. So uh, let's prove this is the proof of theorem 1.3.34. And we're proving if it's finite dimensional, finite dimensional, then unit ball is compact, the closed unit ball. Okay, and the proof is, if it's finite dimensional, we actually know that all the norms are equivalent and that we know they are equivalent to that norm that we looked at last class. So if it's finite dimensional, uh, so we can assume without loss of generality that the norm is the norm we did last class. The norm is this norm. The norm x, we call it the zero norm. It's a, you write the thing as a linear combination of the special set you had, which I think we called E. So you have some basis, E1, E2, and so on. You do alpha 1, E1, and so on, all the way to alpha D, E, D, where that is the dimension of the space. And the norm is the sum of the coefficients, alpha 1 uh, plus all the way up to alpha D. That is the definition of the norm. So in this norm, if you have some sequence um, of things that are in the unit ball, uh, we're going to prove that every every uh, every sequence has a convergent subsequence. So if so, the claim is here's the claim, and it's going to make it clear. If uh, claim if x n is a sequence, then look at the d sequences in R. So you give me a sequence xn, I'm going to make d sequences out of xn and r. What are those sequences? They're the sequence, I'm going to call them alpha 1n, uh, alpha 2n, all the way up to alpha dn. And I get those by writing xn as a linear combination of alpha 1 to alpha d. xn is alpha 1e1 plus and so on, alpha d, e, d, and I'm going to call these with n's. So you give me the sequence of elements in xn, and I actually have d sequences in r, right, which are the coefficients. This is linear algebra land, basically, where anything you want to know about some element of the vector space, well, it's actually d, d sequences of the coefficients. Okay. And alpha 1n is a sequence in r, and not only is it a sequence in R, it's bounded. Why is it bounded? Well, you told me that the norm, uh, the, the sequence Xn is bounded because it's in the unit ball. So we're in the unit ball. So uh, I'll say since Xn is bounded, each alpha 1n, um, I guess alpha Kn is bounded. Is bounded too. Right? That's because the norm is the sum of the alphas. So if the norm of the whole thing is bounded, then the, each individual sequence also has to be bounded. So we have the sequence alpha 1n, alpha 2n, all the way up to alpha dn. Each of them is bounded, and each of them is sequences in R. And now this is one of my favorite theorems in math. It says that, it's called the balzano weierstrass theorem. It says that if you have a sequence in R that is bounded, it has a convergent subsequence, which in the language that we're saying, it just says that the closed interval in R is a compact set. So by the balzano weierstrass theorem, by the this theorem, the balzano weierstrass theorem, again, just fancy talk for the closed intervals in R are bounded. Intervals in R, sorry, they're compact, are compact. So each of these sequences, alpha 1n, alpha 2n, all the way up to alpha dn, each of them is a bounded sequence in R. And so by the balzano weierstrass theorem, they have convergent <coughs> subsequences. Um, OK, so you can find a different convergent subsequence for each of these d things. Um, that's not what we want. We want to find one that is compatible with all of them. So I'm going to do them in order. So by the balzano weierstrass theorem, alpha 1n has a convergent subsequence
alpha one n sub, let's call it n sub k, right? So the coefficients of the first thing, I can find the subsequence so the coefficients converge. Now I'm going to move to the second coefficient, and I'm going to look at alpha two n k. Alpha two n k, those are that's the sequence of the, what are the values of the second coefficient? That is again, it's a bounded sequence in R, and so it has a convergent subsequence. So this has a convergent subsequence, but it's it's really a convergent sub subsequence. Sub sub sequence. So that's alpha. I'm going to call that alpha two of n k l. All right. And then alpha 3 NKL will have a convergent sub 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 sequence. Sub 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 sequence. So I'm taking sub sequences of sub sequences. Alpha 3 NKL P. I don't know, I'm going to run out of letters in a minute. But because the space, the, because we only have finitely many of these, there is D of them. D is some finite number. I'm just going to repeat this game D times. So I'm going to have sub 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 sub, sub repeated D times. And I'm going to have some like magical subsequence, which is a subsequence of a subsequence of a subsequence. Um, so I'm going to go all the way up to alpha d to the n dot dot dot. Uh, let's call it k at the end is a convergent sub 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 sequence. Sub sub. I guess this is like sub to the power d sequence. Sequence. Okay. And if you take this sub to the power d sequence. That sequence will be convergent in the first coordinate, right? Because it's a subsequence of a convergent sequence. It'll be convergent in the second coordinate because it's a subsequence of a, of a convergent sequence, and so on. So this converges in all coordinates. So alpha j of our sequence, I'm going to call our sequence nk, converges for all j for each 1, 2, all the way up to d. So every single coefficient is converging, and when every single coefficient converges, by the definition of the norm, right? the norm just tells you how far away you are in the coefficients. So if all the coefficients are converging, then the xn case are converging too. So therefore, by definition of norm sub 0, uh, xn dot 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 k, so n dot 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 k means this special convergent subsequence converges to. So when you're in finite dimensions, you sort of have d copies of r, and the Balzano Weierstrass theorem for r, you apply it sort of d times to get that every individual coefficient is converging, and that gives you a uh, convergent sequence. So really, like, this is saying that, uh, um, you know, r to the d is the same as r, and all norm spaces with finite dimensions of dimension d are kind of the same as r to the d. That's kind of what we've done. All right, any questions or comments about that one? Okay, let's do the other direction. The other direction says, if it's an infinite dimensional space, then it, the unit ball is not compact. So if it's infinite dimension, you can always do this thing, like the example I gave, where you have some sequence like this, where you're running off to infinity, but always inside the unit ball. And uh, there's a short proof, but it relies on something called Reese's Lemma. Uh, so our, we won't have time for Reese's Lemma, but I'll give you the, the, the proof. So theorem 1.3.34, if it's infinite dimensional, if it's infinite dimensional, then unit ball is not compact. Is not compact. <coughs> okay. And what we do is we're going to make a sequence that's not a Cauchy sequence. You'll see what this is. So uh, here is Reese's Lemma. Uh, yeah, okay, let, let, me, let me tell you the setup first. So I'm just going to pick, first I pick any x1, choose x1, so that the norm of x1 equals 1. So my, I'm just going to pick something whose norm is 1. You could just pick any arbitrary element and then do that scaling thing. You divide it by its norm, that'll be something that's norm 1. And then I'm going to do something funny here. I'm going to make a space called s1, which is the span of x1. And this is a linear subspace. So this is all the things that are linear combinations of x1, uh, x1 being just one element. This is scalar multiples of x1. So not very exciting. Um, but here is the thing that you can do. You can always choose, can find, an x2, which is not in s1, so that 
the norm of x2 minus s is greater than or equal to 1 half uh, for all s in s1. And, oh, and, and the norm of x2 is also 1. OK. So this is a fact that if you have some subspace, you can always find another vector which is kind of far away from that subspace. So if the distance to the subspace was 0, you would be right in that subspace. You would be some element of S1. But you can actually find something that is not in S1 and is sort of at least distance 1 half from S1. And in fact, this thing is called Reese's lemma. So Reese is some famous uh, analyst mathematician. Uh, and Reese's lemma, it says, um, you can always find something that's greater than 1 minus epsilon, even for any epsilon greater than 0. So if x is a subspace, uh, let me call it s so we don't get mixed up. If s is any subspace, s is not equal to the whole space, not equal entire space, can find x not in s so that the norm of x minus s is at least 1 minus epsilon, and the norm of x equals 1. Uh, and this is for any epsilon greater than 0. So this is Reese's lemma. And it's not hard. Um, it's just kind of like, again, doing some manipulation with distances and scalings, uh, and, and thinking about what sort of this, like, what is the minimum distance and that kind of thing. So it's, it's not some super difficult thing. We are going to skip it, though. Um, so you have to believe me a Reese's lemma. And I'm only using it with a half. So Reese's lemma is good all the way up to 0.99999, and I'm using it. I'm only using 0.5. So I'm using it like a baby version of Reese's lemma. OK, so I found this point x1. I found this point x2. x2 is nowhere near x1. Now I make the, the space s2, which is the span of x1 and x2. And I use Reese's lemma again to find x3 so that the norm of x3 minus s is at least a half for all s in s2. So basically what I'm doing is I'm constructing a sequence by adding points to my space s. I have s1, which is just the span of x1. I have s2, which is the span of x1, x2. s3 is going to be the span of s, x1, x2, x3. And I'm just going to keep collecting points. And I'm going to keep finding points that are not near this subspace. So x4, such that the norm of x4 minus s is at least a half. Oh, these are all unit points, right? They're all norm 1. OK. And you can just do this forever and ever. You will never get to the full space because we, you were, we were told that the uh, space is infinite dimensional. So the space is s will never equal the entire space. You can just keep applying Reese's lemma over and over again. You get an infinite sequence. And this infinite sequence, it is what I call not Cauchy. So repeat forever. Repeat forever. And the resulting sequence is not Cauchy. Uh, the sequence xn uh, is always norm 1. The norm of xn is always 1 for all n by construction. And it is not Cauchy. Uh, not Cauchy. What do I mean by not Cauchy? I mean it has this property that uh, the norm of xn minus xm is greater than or equal to a half for all n not equal to m. And this is like strongly not Cauchy. So we are going to do Cauchy sequences again uh, next, in the next class or the class after that. If you've never seen Cauchy sequences, Cauchy sequences are sequences where the points get really close to each other. So a convergent subsequence is xn is going to x. All the xn's get really close to x. Cauchy sequences get really close to themselves. And so for a Cauchy sequence, xn minus xm in norm is less than epsilon. This one is not Cauchy because it's always bigger than a half. And it's a very easy fact to prove that any sequence that is not Cauchy cannot converge. Um, therefore, xn cannot Converge. And actually, the proof is very easy. I could have skipped labeling it as not Cauchy, but it will help you kind of visualize what's going on. This is a sequence where all the elements are at least distance one half from each other. 
So how could they possibly converge to something? If they converge to something, then you would eventually be within epsilon of that something, and then if you're within epsilon of that something, and I'm within epsilon of that something, then we're within two epsilon of each other, but you told me we were at least half apart. Let's write that down. Suppose by contradiction, by contradiction, <coughs> xn goes to x, but then for all epsilon greater than zero, the norm of xn minus x is less than epsilon, but the norm of xn minus xm, uh, this is for all n bigger than n, the norm of xn minus xm is less than or equal to the norm of xn minus x plus the norm of xm minus x is less than 2 epsilon. So if you have a convergent subsequence, then all the points eventually are within 2 epsilon of each other. But our sequence in particular has the property that all the points are at least distance one half from each other. So our sequence cannot possibly converge. Um, okay. And I will say one more thing, and actually this, this matters. Everything I've said, I did it for the sequence xn. I should have done it for a subsequence. We're trying to prove that no subsequence of xn can converge. Uh, so not only can xn cannot converge, therefore no subsequence, subsequence. X and K cannot converge. Why can no subsequence converge? Well, if the XNs are all at least a half from apart, any subsequence of XN will also be distance one half apart. Um, so I don't know. I'll say any subsequence is also not Cauchy. Any subsequence is also not Cauchy. Okay. So this has the flavor, and it's just like the example I gave you, where you basically are finding this like infinite sequence of points that are always norm one, but are sort of like far apart from each other. If you looked at the example that I gave, right, uh, it was these spike examples. The, this sequence xn has the property that the norm of xn minus xm is actually one for n not equal to m. So it's exactly the proof of the theorem is basically make an example like this, and you can sort of make it by force using Reese's lemma that says you can always make the span of the first n things and find some next element that is not in that span and is like far away. Um, okay, we're gonna stop there and uh, we'll see you guys next class on Thursday. We'll talk about more about Cauchy sequences and convergence and that kind of thing. Uh, I will also say I have office hours from one to two on Thursdays. If you guys wanna come by, feel free to, to stop by.